Okay, so to do a little review, we're gonna do a quiz, not quiz. So go ahead and try to do this on your own and then come back when you're done. But what I want you guys to do is I want you to draw on each one of these plates um, what the uh, pressure and stress distributions look like or what you think they look like. Um, so we have a, a plate that is parallel to the uh, flow on top and then a plate that is perpendicular to the flow on bottom. Um, yeah, go ahead and draw the, uh, draw both of these. Pause it and then come back. All right, so I'm gonna go start now. So for the pressure distribution on the flat plate, there will be a, uh, some pressure acting on the front here and also some pressure acting on the back. Um, because both of these are stagnation points. So we're gonna have stagnant fluid, which means we're gonna have high pressure. Um, and then along the top and bottom, we will have almost entirely just shear stress. So technically, hold on, let's just do tau here. So in this case, drag is dominated by shear and lift is dominated by, well, nothing really, because there's no lift, right? There's no forces pointing in the y direction, perpendicular to the flow. Okay, now for the other plate, here we have flow coming in. We know that in the middle, there's gonna be a stagnation point because we're gonna have a streamline that comes in and then stagnates right there. And then we're gonna have other streamlines that come in and come around like this. And we know flow separates, except for if it's very, very slow, very low rent number. Um, the flow will separate because it can't go around this 180 degree bend. So it's going to come around and produce a turbulent, we're gonna do this on this side too turbulent low pressure region right here. Um, and as we move away from this central stagnated streamline, the flow increases in speed. So we know it's pressure decreases. So our pressure starts off high, reaches zero at the end, ends like this. So very high pressure in the middle. And on the back side, we have a pretty uniform low pressure region. Now we have shear stress in this situation. We know we have shear moving in this direction along the plate, which are kind of hard to draw. Um, and a little bit of shear along these edges back here. So in this case, drag is dominated by pressure. And lift is dominated by, well, again, there's no lift. So that's a trick question, kind of. So in this case, technically, a flat plate is a streamlined object because its drag force is dominated by shear stress. Um, the bottom object is dominated by pressure, so it is not streamlined. It is a blunt object. Well, if you want to do a really fun internet dive, look up the just how they started designing streamlined objects when they realized this distinction, right? They realized that uh, they being engineers and also designers in general, they realized that if you rounded, rounded objects and tapered them, that the drag reduced, was reduced on them because you had less pressure drag, but they didn't have the tools that they needed in order to um, kind of, what I would say is engineer them well, right? And so you get these fantastical looking teardrop shaped objects. Oh, it's just, they're beautiful. They're just absolutely beautiful, but not actually that functional. They're better than a box, but not as good as what we can, nearly as good as what we can do today. Okay, so um, the, and it, these two objects are extreme, right? We have flat plates perpendicular, uh, perpendicular and parallel to the flow, they're extremes. In every other object, the balance between shear force and pressure is dominated by the boundary layer. And boundary layers are a clear area where viscous effects are important. 
Okay. Let's write that right here. Um, so what's interesting about this is that um, let's, let's look at first uh, a case where we have no actual boundary layer. When we have really low Reynolds numbers, so a Reynolds number of less than 10, for example, um, when we draw the flow behind this plate, let's draw the flow profile behind this plate, we know that because of no slip condition, the flow starts at the same speed as the plate, so it's zero. And we know that away from the plate, the flow has to be moving at the same speed as the free stream velocity. And in between, it has to transfer, transfer slowly to that, to that speed. And we can draw our flow, our flow profile like that. We can do a mirror on the bottom. And in this case, streamlines are going to, we can kind of draw a region of large influence of our plate. And this is the region where um, we might say streamlines deflect due to the plate, right? So if we draw some streamlines here, they're gonna come in and they're gonna start seeing the plate because the plate is slowing down fluid. And we had a homework problem like this, right? because the plate slows down fluid, because of conservation of mass, the fluid ha the flow has to increase in area. If the, flow is, if the velocity is decreasing, the area has to increase. And so all the flow, uh, the flow starts to spread out and move out, right? And so our streamlines will start deflecting in this direction, like this. The closer you get to the plate, the more they deflect because the slower the fluid is going, so the more it has to move away, the flow has to move away from the plate in order to conserve mass, right? Um, but because our Reynolds number is so low, and remember Reynolds number is equal to rho v d over mu, and if there's one thing I want you to remember is that the Reynolds number is a ratio of inertial to viscous effects, viscous forces, right? So if we have a low Reynolds number, that means our viscous forces are, are dominating everywhere. Our viscous forces are dominating everywhere. And remember that the boundary layer is a clear area where viscous effects are important. And so if viscous effects are everywhere important, we have no boundary layer. So remember that for low Reynolds numbers, we don't have a boundary layer. But for high Reynolds numbers area, uh, high Reynolds number flows, we have a very clear area here dotted in red where um, viscous effects are important. Then outside of this area, they are not important. And so if we draw our flow profile here, our flow profile is gonna go from zero to our mean free stream velocity very quickly, and then stay relatively constant after that. There we go. And outside of this flow, we can model this uh, fluid as being inviscid outside of this dashed red line. Inside though, viscous effects dominate and we have to assume it's a viscous uh, fluid. Um, and uh, yeah, inside of this red line again, because fluid is slowing down, streamlines will deflect inside of this dashed red line area. So, what, what's really hard about this is that most of our flows live in this region, not 10 to the seventh necessarily, but Reynolds numbers of uh, a million or more, right? And the hard part about this is that there's no, there aren't very many good ways of connecting flow in a viscous region and flow of the inviscid region. In fact, this was um, one of the great unsolved problems of the 20th century? Is that how you say it? The 1900s? I can't remember. Anyway, so like 1950s and 60s, if you were a, a, a really smart mathematician, you were working, uh, and in, in engineering, you were working on connecting this viscous boundary layer to the flow around it. Um, and, and, and figuring out how that affected the flow, because this viscous layer is very small. On an airplane, when you're flying, um, 
like a, a commercial jet, there the this boundary layer is about the thickness of a piece of paper, right? And yet the flow within that thickness of a piece of paper dictates everything about how well that plane's gonna fly, right? We can create a disturbance in this viscous layer and cause the plane to stall, right? And fall out of the sky. So um, it's, it's a very important balance. And it's, it's um, still an area of study because it's very hard to model these kinds of things too. You need a very fine mesh in your viscous layer but you don't need to find a mesh in your um, inviscid layer and connecting the two and doing high Reynolds numbers is very, very difficult. So let's look at two different kinds of fish and let's try to determine if a boundary layer develops on that fish. So we have a 15 millimeter minnow, if you will. So this is about um, 1.5 centimeters. It's a very small fish moving at 22 millimeters a second, right? And then we have a 1.5 meter tuna, tuna fish, moving at two meters per second, which is actually quite slow for a, a tuna. They can, those things can cruise. Um, so let's, let's figure this out. So the, in order to determine whether or not uh, the boundary layer develops on a, a surface, we have to know the Reynolds number. So in this case, our Reynolds number is going to be equal to rho v l over mu, where there's a characteristic length along the plate, right? Um, we can combine rho and mu into nu our kinematic viscosity for fresh water, and that's equal to, so our Reynolds number becomes V L over nu. And so for our small fish, this is gonna be um, 0 0.02 meters per second times 0 0.015 meters divided by 1.12 times 10 to the negative sixth meters squared per second squared. meter squared per second, sorry, meter squared per second is kinematic viscosity. So um, this ends up being equal to 280, 268, 268, which is quite low, quite low. So viscous effects are dominating and there's no true boundary layer, no true boundary layer. Now, if we look at this much larger fish, we're gonna see uh, obviously a larger Reynolds number. So RE is equal to um, VL over new, which is equal to 1.5 meters times 2 meters per second divided by 1.12 times 10 to the negative 6 meters squared per second, which is equal to 2.7 times 10 to the 6th. So we're easily into the millions now, which is a much higher Reynolds number. So inertial effects dominate and a true boundary layer does form. And if you look closely at the design of fish, fish that stay in this kind of region for for swimming look very different than fish that, that stay in this region of high Reynolds numbers. Um, and what's really fascinating is looking how the body forms of fish change as they get larger. Uh, look up sunfish, sunfish uh, babies, I guess you would say them, or fry, I think is what they're called. And see how their body form changes from being when they're very small compared to when they're huge, just absolutely huge fish. Um, and you'll see that uh, when they're small, they're, they take a body form that would never work for a large fish because they can, because the Reynolds number are so small and viscous, viscous effects are gonna dim and dominate anyway. So you can have sharp corners and it's not gonna matter because you're not gonna have flow separation. You're not gonna have large amounts of pressure drag. So very interesting. All right. Next one, we're going to talk about laminar boundary layers and some characteristics of laminar boundary layers.